Hi. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, we were like, let's just do the highs. And then it's like, oh, wait, we have to say something afterwards. I, uh. I thought that we aced that. I'm very <laughs> proud of us. Welcome. A bite of very special episode. Um, we got to see Heartstopper season three early. Warning you now. I'm just putting that out there. There will be spoilers in this episode for season three and all of Heartstopper. Um, so please watch it. And then be spoiled. <laughs> yes, we will literally be talking about every single thing that happens in the entire season. So it's not even like you could maybe avoid something. Yeah, you will be spoiled. <laughs> but we'll, I'll remind you again. Um, by the way, I am Noah. And as always, my heart stopper always joined with me. The lovely Derek. <laughs> you're, you're the lovely Noah. Oh, um, we are your heart stopper guides to all of season three mm -hmm. um before we get into everything make sure you're following us on all the socials we're actually going to be on vacation so we're getting you're getting a double dose of us this week heart Stopper and agatha <sighs> yes you're, you're welcome i do love <laughs> that when we go on vacation it is very much a huge part of the decision of when we can cover episodes yeah because we always think about you guys before going on we want to make sure we deliver yeah <laughs> but also make sure you're following us on social media platforms Follow the podcast, follow us. Um, you'll get to see all our happenings in Orlando while we're there. Um, we got a Patreon, got a Discord, got an Agatha Coven Discord going on, spoiler chat. Um, so all of those things. So if you're watching us on YouTube, you know, subscribe. If you're watching us on Spotify or listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, subscribe. It's all the same thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I think spoilers from here on out. Yes. Officially. Official spoiler review. All right. So let us officially take a bite of Heartstopper Season 3, written by Alice Oseman. Isn't that amazing? We get like the writer of the graphic novel, originally a webtoon online comic. Still a webtoon. Still. Yeah. Now to a Netflix series and is writing it. Ooh, so good. I know. It's incredible. So... We are three seasons in to Heartstopper. We are three seasons covering it on the podcast. What are your thoughts? After we finished watching all of these episodes, how did you feel? <laughs> so I have read all the books, the five volumes that are out. So I knew what was coming, but I still think that they did such an incredible job at portraying it. Um, the thing that I love most about it is... Alice just has a way of so simply showing how hard, but also how joyous life can be. Mm -hmm. And it's just in this one group of teenagers. Um, I think at the end of it, it just was the, I, it felt like the realist season in the sense of like, these are the very real problems that they're dealing with versus will they, won't they? Oh, right. So it's like past the... The meet cute. Exactly. Past and, the meet cute, past the liking each other, past the what, you know, who am I? And it's like, oh, okay, now we're in the thick of it. For some of them. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> the question of identity. Yes, 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 yes. I feel, which is a very integral part of the show. Um, I 100% agree. Um, if I could sum this up in one sentence, our babies are a mess mm. this season. And in, I think rightfully so, right? It's they're getting older. Their relationships are deepening. They're evolving. I think what makes these types of stories so engaging is that we've all experienced this type of thing in some way. Not even just the, the queer identities, mm. right? Or the LGBTQ plus identities. It's more of like those relationships with friends and also like your first love and doing that in high school or middle school and then changing schools. So we're right on the cusp of that in this season of what is going to happen with everybody when people go off to uni? When life continues, mm -hmm. right, from this falling in love moment. What right. happens after you fall in love? What happens after you become a couple? What happens after your heart stops? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Scary. So I, I very much really, really, really enjoyed this season. I do think the first season is my favorite because it's so special and it's just like that first thing. But this one, I think execution amazing they did so many different things in this season and it felt newer but the same which i i needed personally because mm -hmm. i was like how much are we going to see of like almost the same thing 
Um, I did not read the books. I'm very much by choice deciding not to read them because I want to be surprised. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to put that out there. You said you've read them. I didn't read <laughs> yes, them. Yes. <laughs> and I've been a very good husband in not letting anything leak. I think the last thing that I said to you was that after the last scene, I said, okay, well, things are going to get a little more serious in this next one. And I like to think I was right. They, you were. They followed the storyline. Mm. You know, they weren't afraid to take that leap. Right. Um, which I'm glad I didn't know. And I was surprised in many different ways for this season. Um, so how we're going to do this episode, because every, you know, it's such a big friend group. I do feel like out of all of the seasons, we have our friend group that's going to be kind of what the friend group is. Um, we don't have many outside people. Mm. In this season, as we did in the other two, like the bullies really aren't a factor in this one. And it's really more about the relationships. So let's just do it couple by couple or person by person, mm. um, because we can't forget about our baby Isaac, <laughs> which is one of my favorite characters. Our beautiful <laughs> bibliophile. Yeah. We love Isaac. So we'll do it, um, you know, couple by couple. Should we start? I'm going to say, oh man, who should we start with? Should we do Darcy? And Tara, I don't want to do Nick and Charlie. No, I agree. I actually think <laughs> that, oh no. Okay. <laughs> we love them all equally. Yes. I actually think we should start. Down up? Yes. Okay. Because <laughs> the way we have it written. Yeah. I think should be the opposite. I do want to switch one. Okay, that's fine. You guys are watching live editing right now. <laughs> I could have just cut this out. <laughs> no, I want them to know. <laughs> what we deal with. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, I feel better with that. All right. You kick it off. So the first couple we're going to start with is a very quick conversation. They're very much the B, C, D storyline, but they're just, it's floating around. So we're going to talk about Mr. Ajayi and Mr. Farouk. So since Paris, the pair have become even closer and are now trying to hide their relationship from the boys at True. Mm -hmm. So for a second, I wasn't sure where we were with them, right? Because when we first see them, they're kind of like sitting in a car together a little awkwardly and you're thinking, oh no, did they decide to not explore this anymore because they're going back to school? But it's actually like, okay, breathe. We have to pretend that this isn't happening. Yeah, I was, I, it's not that I forgot about them, but when I saw them together, I was like, oh yeah, they like, I don't want to say hooked up, but they found each other in Paris mm. um, and probably hooked up. But, the romance <laughs> right which is fine it's paris city love um i love them so much because i think for us as older gay men it is a little more relatable in some aspects of seeing older gay men kind of navigate the work life also relationship life but also working together yeah and then being in a society that is mostly straight and how do you navigate that? Because we, we really don't know their stories. Like how comfortable is one with their sexuality as opposed to Farouk, which seemed like he had some reservations. Mm -hmm. um, so I just love seeing them be like, okay, we're going to do this, but like maybe not broadcast it and yeah. advertise it because like sometimes the kids at Truem are not nice. That's true. <laughs> We've met quite a few of them. I do though in, in my mind i do think it's one of those things where they're trying so hard to not be obvious that it's actually so obvious and all the students totally know and don't really care at all yeah because i what was it the rugby coach that caught them in the car yes and she was like you guys got to be a little more sneaky than yes that. totally because they're kissing in the car and you know you kind of brought up a good point it is interesting because we're obviously married and we work together so it's like it is an interesting dynamic right that's what i was getting at yeah and you got it <laughs> you got there but it is it is it's funny to see that because it's like oh yeah that's like our daily life yeah i feel like we need to do like i mean we need to do just like a hangout where we can like actually tell people who we are on patreon of course <laughs> <laughs> yes because i do feel like sometimes people like we we will get comments very rarely but occasionally of like i didn't know you guys were married it's like well, yeah, we're not going to make out on the podcast. <laughs> we could. <laughs> but like, we're not there. We're not there yet. That's not the type of content you clicked on. <laughs> no, we are not that. <laughs> Nor does our Patreon have that. <laughs> but fairly, maybe. <laughs> no, not of us making out. <laughs> um, but yes, we are married. But so I did find some relatability to that. Yeah. Not like 
we're very open and everybody obviously knows um, at work. That would be weird if we were married and <laughs> told nobody. <laughs> yeah, no, I, right. Imagine we're really trying to pull the wall over their eyes and then yeah. it's like the same ad- home address. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back to these two lovely lovebird oh, teachers. Yeah. Um, I loved, I loved getting a little check in with them. Yeah. And I liked that there was um, not to jump the gun, but there was um, some comfort still there in the art room. Mm-hmm. Charlie knows that that's the safe space. Um, so I liked that still being there. Yeah, I do. I, I love that. And I also love, though, um, there, was, there was a moment in this that actually, it was so quick, but it actually made me tear up. So towards the end of the season, they're basically saying to Charlie, we think it would be really great if you applied to be head boy mm-hmm. next year. And Miss Farouk says something like, I think that the younger kids could look up to someone like you. And we get a flash of Mr. Farouk as a little boy. And so that made me really tear up because I often find myself uh, feeling inspired by the younger generation. And, you know, I'm going to be 40 next year. So I didn't really come out fully, like socially living my truth until I got to college, till I was 18 years old. But it wasn't too far after that, that kids really felt comfortable coming out in high school um, and now even younger than that. So I'm, I, I get that for, with Mr. Farouk, being able to reflect on your own life and experiences through the younger generation and seeing how far we've come and being proud at how proud they could be at such a young age. Yeah. And then also being an example for the newer generation mm-hmm. coming in, which I liked that they did point out because it was like, when you, if you're not watching the screen, when that interaction happens, you think it's like, oh, okay, about like the younger people that are coming in, which is true. But then when you see that flash of him, it's like, oh, it's also for his self that yes. wasn't able to do that. Oh. Exactly. Because I could have used you when it, I was a little one. Right. And there's so there's at least, I think, three different times where they do that with the characters and they show them young. And I'm like, you need to stop making me almost cry. Those give me the <laughs> chills, right? Because you know, being someone who has gone to therapy and has done yoga certification, you know, you explore the little child that still lives within you. And that little child still has so many wounds and and has shaped us and who we've become as adults. And so when they show those little kids, not only is it cute because they found little actors that look so much like them, but it's, it's really driving that home of, we all just still have this little version inside of us that needs comforting and love. And so that's that moment right yeah it is that moment it's like the healing moment Ugh, they, and they do it so well like the editing with it it's just like it's a flash yeah and it's like oh f- fuck <laughs> it's like we whenever that happens no and i do like an an audible like because oh, it's just too freaking sweet and too touching literally stopping my heart <laughs> <sighs> all right on to our next pair. duo yes so this is imogen and sahar So after a drunk kiss at a party, they have a falling out over what it means to each of them. Sahar comes out as bisexual, while Imogen doesn't know who she is when it comes to love and her own identity. Just when I thought Heartstopper covered all of the bases of um, somebody's identity, relationships with relationships and other genders and identities, they throw this in there. You know, there was something that happened in season two Mm -hmm. where i was like okay imogen said she was an ally fantastic in the first season and she's proving that to be true then sahar comes in and it's like oh who is this yeah she sees sahar on stage and like gets this like dreamy doe-eyed look on her face and it's like wait what is gonna happen so when this kiss happens while i got excited i was like wait but what does that mean and i'm so glad that this show went into that because I think it is very, very, very important for this kind of thing to happen because there are moments of exploring, which I think should be 100% encouraged with both consenting parties um, and seeing what that meant for both of them. I I believe there was a moment where when they finally talk about it because they have some friction after it because when everybody sees them kissing, Imogen acts like 
the girl at the party. I'm so drunk. Right. Yeah. And it's different for Sahar, which uh, was kind of heartbreaking because I was rooting for them. But then I was like, oh, wait, I don't think Imogen is like wants to do that. <laughs> yeah. But the but it shouldn't come at the detriment of one of the people involved. Exactly. The exploration. Exactly. So when they finally talk about it, I liked that they got to the conclusion of Sahar being like, you made me realize things about myself. Like I am bisexual. And the same thing happened with Imogen as well. She's like, you made me realize things. I don't know what they are yet, but you made me realize stuff. And I love that they both were like, we probably shouldn't be a couple. Yeah. Which is like, yes. Okay. Just be really good friends. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I want to just put this out there now because I felt this throughout the entire kind of, well, actually throughout the series so far, we had spoken about this in our, the coverage of our first season when Nick comes out to his mother. And we said something along the lines of, this is the example conversation to have. This is how you react when someone says, when someone comes out to you. This is how you're supportive to them. And so I think one of the other things that Alice does so well in this is that she shows really healthy, clear communication yes. within all the characters. And also right? realistic. Right. And so the fact that these two, what, 15, 16 year olds, can look at each other and be like, this is how I'm openly, honestly feeling. It's a really wonderful thing to see, right. you know, especially put out on the screen for other kids to see of just have a conversation. Don't keep your hurt feelings closed because you'll just end up hurting yourself even more. Talk to the person about it. Right. And so this is just one of the instances in this season where healthy communication is put at the center of a relationship. And I like that the Alice and team they do that and make sure, okay, let me, let me try to like frame this thought that makes sense to everybody. That's not me <laughs> is they could very easily do the fantasy or the realistic version, like super realistic where it's like, they don't talk about it. Right. And then like after months pass, they're like, oh, we're friends again. We're not going to talk about it. What I love about this is that they make sure it's a priority to address it. And also be like, this might be some real things that somebody says in this conversation, but here's the healthy way to maybe resolve this or to get past whatever's happening, mm -hmm. um, which I think is so important because it's one thing to be like, you know, queer people get bullied, queer people have a time with blah, blah, blah. It's like, we know we, we experience it. That's another thing to also in the lens of this, educate people that might have those questions about their son, their relative, their sibling, whatever, that's going through these things. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, it's good to have this thing where it shows the healthy side and that it, it will be okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, exactly. And I think that there are so many different types of relationships in this show that you can, you can learn from any of the conversations that are happening. <laughs> any. any. Any of them. Just even, just about communication in general. But I, I also just wanted to touch on uh, Imogen, another conversation, has an interesting conversation with Nick. And so she says things along the lines of, I don't know if I ever really liked you because that's what was always expected of me. I was the popular girl. I needed to have a boyfriend. She's like, but I don't really think I did. And therefore, I don't really know who I am when it comes to love. And so I thought that was really interesting, too. Of this character just being like, I was, I, I, I had myself so placed in a very specific box for a very long time. And now I'm not so sure that that's actually the box I should exist in, or even just in this way of yeah. existing in it. So I thought that was another really interesting talk about identity and what's expected of you versus who you really are. I think, it, I think she very much, um, at least right now, is the questioning. Mm. right and obviously they're all still kids and they're figuring it out they're not going to figure themselves out for a long time i don't think i've figured myself out yet um which is fine i think people evolve but i i think that is really important because there are there is so many people straight or not where you're expected to do certain things you're expected to do the sports you're expected to get whatever grades you're expected to because you're of a certain status go out with somebody of a certain status so i think that there's a lot of um, themes of pressure mm -hmm. and that becoming overwhelming for our 
our gang here. Mm. Um, and it shows itself in different ways. And I think for her, she's finally able to, when she finally kissed Sahar, it was one of those things of like, oh, people caught me like, oh, that was a joke. But wait, what does that say? Like, I feel different after that. Does that mean I like it? Or this was just something that I should explore? Or what is it? Or maybe nobody. And you know? there's and there's no answer at this point right. in time right. for Imogen, which again, is fine. It's As totally viewers, fine. we don't need the well, what are you? Season four. Exactly. We have more time. <laughs> I will say a small critique I have mm. is that I wish that we would get to know Sahar more. I do too. I She's just, great at guitar and singing. Um, but that's about more. all we know. Yeah. Right. And so she was kind of like um, in, in this season, it felt like she was very much a footnote on Imogen's journey and not necessarily there exploring her own. Right. right. Or at least maybe, we didn't get to see it. Maybe next season. You know, and I, I think... I do agree. I feel like she was really the only one of the gang that was kind of like, she's here. Yeah. But like the veal with Imogen, which granted Imogen has been here longer. I don't think that warrants like sidestepping it, but Mm. I think we'll get more. I hope so. I hope so. On to the next one. On to the next one. We got quite a few. (laughs) (laughs) So up next we have Tara and Darcy. So after being kicked out by their mother, Darcy has been living with Tara's family. But Tara feels that the new living arrangement is adding to her stress of already feeling overwhelmed by school and life. Darcy then moves in with their grandmother and finds confidence in their non-binary identity. So much to unpack Mm. with both of them. But I feel like as we're like talking about these couples and leading up to Nick and Charlie, we're kind of hitting on a lot of things that the all of the couples go through or have gone through. So it makes it easier to like get to the meat Mm. (laughs) of their relationship. I love them. I love their relationship. I think it's really unique in a, in, in a light that I haven't really seen in TV and stuff like that, especially for at least in the beginning, a lesbian couple. Well, I think that they are still lesbians, even though one is (laughs) non-binary. I didn't mean, (laughs) um, (laughs) again, we're not, experts in this field if we say anything that's like not correct please let us yes, know yes. in the comments we are very much open to being corrected <laughs> just because we are part of the community does not know mean in any way shape or form that we are fully educated on every single person that exists in it clearly yeah <laughs> so I'm like they were lesbians in the beginning of the season <laughs> not anymore um yes but i think that it not often do we get a healthy lesbian couple Mm -mm. you know um which was what i was trying to say so just say that um but man you know i i gotta be like there was a moment where um darcy goes into tara's room when they're living together and she's just kind of like throwing everything around oh i felt i felt tara in that in that instance because it was like she's stressed as it is to be perfect and go to the perfect school and get all the perfect grades and then it's like the person that you love is like there mm. and like not respecting your space. Mm. And so like, granted, she didn't get mad at her, but you could tell like that was the moment where she was like, I think it's healthy for us to not be here yet. <laughs> yes. And, you know, <laughs> I think it's it's an interesting thing when someone moves in and shares your space with you. Right. And so you lived one way for so long and now you're sharing a space with someone else. And so I understand there being growing pains in that. Um, But this is literally throwing trash on the floor. So I was not being very forgiving towards Darcy because that just threw me for a loop. Noah and I, um, we're very neat people. You know, just everything has its little place in our home. And so that's where those things go. So trash does not go on the floor. No. Okay. Especially in the room. Come on. Just emptying out your wallet purse or whatever yeah. it was everywhere <gasps> fanny pack i don't think so yo uh, i it is kind of funny though because you know in in their journey in their relationship tara is the first one to say i love you tara is really putting herself out there for darcy uh and then you know she kind of finally gets all of darcy and then she's like well that's too that okay now it's too much yeah you know which is understandable i'm just it, it's just so funny it's like you kind of wish for this thing and then it all comes at you at once and it's sometimes it's a little too much to handle well i think you know with i think with her with tara's journey in this season in particular is she really needs to make decisions 
that are going to change her life. She has those expectations from her mother, which we saw of her like being like, you're going to get into the best schools. You're going to be amazing and everything. And it's like, well, granted she is, that is so much pressure. I almost feel like a lot of times that's worse than just letting them come to you and just praising them when they do a good job instead Mm -hmm. of being like, you're automatically going to be good at it. And it's like, well, that's pressure. Well, here are all the expectations (laughs) I have for you and you have to meet them. And so whenever we see that scene of they're at Charlie's birthday at his house and they made those tents outside, which oh, so much fun. Did you ever do that when you were a kid? No, Hmm. not tents outside, but uh, when one time there was a giant blackout on the East coast Mm -hmm. and all of my friends came over and because no air conditioners or anything worked, it was during the summer. We all slept outside. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. There were no tents. We just had blankets and stuff. We would do that. Like we would have like the trampoline and we would put tent like obviously sheets like over the trampoline to where like you had to like go under it. So fun. It was really fun. Um, so I very much like that. I was like, yeah, I would have done that until high school too. Um, but that's when she really gets her panic attack, um, because all of it's coming at her. And it was just one more thing to add on top of like the expectations and the choices that she has to make, um, which we'll get into it. But I love that because Charlie was equipped with tools to help himself, he was able to help somebody else. Ah, so important. So, so important. But also on the other side, Darcy's journey, love. Yeah. She was able to get away from her abusive, toxic household. She got to be with Tara for a little bit. And thank God her mother was accepting of that and letting her be there. And then going with her grandmother, Ugh, which she just encouraged her. Yes. Her grandmother was so delightful. Yeah. Encouraged them um, because they came out as non-binary, which at least they were like, I think this feels right. Like, this is where I want to be. And I love that they were like, I can't remember who they were talking to, but they said something of like, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Like, just tell people you don't have to come out again. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) You know, and I and I also liked the 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 kind of increments that it happened in. It was really them figuring things out in real time of like, I think I want to try they them pronouns. All right. I think I want to try cutting my hair a little differently. I think I want to wear these this the clothing that my mother was so against me wearing, you know, and not to say that a non-binary person has to have a mullet and wear suspenders. But it was just all a journey of Darcy feeling comfortable in their journey of mm-hmm. self-acceptance and taking those little steps to just making them feel more comfortable as who they are. And it was really nice to see, too, because we saw in the second season, I believe, um, when we got to see Darcy's home life um, and we saw that what it, that was the one where they had the dance, right? Mm -hmm. And they wanted to wear like the tux, but that was like one of the tipping points for their mother. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was really nice to see that when they were at their grandmother's and they put on stuff that would typically be for men or not feminine. um, And the grandmother was like, yes, yes. Like she was hyping her up. It's like, oh, that is just, that's beautiful to see. It's just those tiny, small moments that mean everything. And also I love their hair. Yeah, so cool. Loved it. So cool. Because <laughs> I know I've seen it in press and I'm like, oh, their hair is so cool. And I just thought that was just them outside of the character. And I know. No. That is the character now. <laughs> They're really bringing themselves into this character, which is really mm-hmm. cool to see. Yeah. Uh, so we Tara, love our little lesbian couple. I know. They're just <laughs> they're they're just always just like being very supportive of everyone and working through their own drama, you know, really without without a lot of outside interference. And I do, I, I want to say, before we move away from them, I absolutely loved that we got another Tara and Nick conversation. Me too. I love that it's showing that there's relationships within the friend group that aren't the couples, mm-hmm. right? Um, and in last season, she helped Nick a lot and vice versa. And in this season, same thing. Oh, it just makes me very happy. Yeah. And you know... Just to kind of step off of that, one of the things that I really enjoy is that there's never any judgment either towards the person that's sharing their issue or towards their significant other that the issue is about. Right. The, the person is always just like sort of actively listening, asking questions that are a little thought provoking and being like, OK, well, you'll figure it out, you right. know, and we and so it's never like I can't believe they're doing this mm-hmm. or, you know, as most sort of teenage conversations tend to go. 
I think the only time that they ever tip that way is I can't remember exact instances, so forgive me. Um, I just know it's happened in almost every season, and that's just because they're like a kid friend group is like when they're like going to do something or going to say something, but they've said it to somebody else and not somebody like they're more friend friend, like mm. Tao, I believe. I think that happened a lot in the first season of like kind of Charlie not wanting to tell him everything. So like that happens a little bit, but I'm glad they got away from that because I think it happened more in the first and second. Definitely. And this one, it was just more of like, no, yeah. <laughs> the couples are dealing with their stuff and they're all collectively a mess. A hundred percent. And I mean, that is what it is to be 16 and yeah. 17 years old. I mean, uh, obviously. Um, but yeah, I agree. It definitely happened in the first season, especially with Tao not really trusting Nick in the beginning. So, but they're past that now. Yeah. They're, they're, they're dealing with their own inner problems, not with all the outside <laughs> issues of being children. Speaking of, um, not being a problem at all. I know, just a little baby. So Isaac comes out to Charlie first, and then the rest of the group of friends as asexual and aromantic. He often feels like the third wheel to all of their intense relationships. I really enjoyed that they went more into the storyline. And I actually didn't realize that he had never come out as asexual and aromantic. Agreed, yeah. Um, and also... Because of my uneducating myself in the second season, I, for the longest time, assumed aromantic and asexual were the same thing. Mm. They're not. And it's good to, again, have a reminder of both of these things being different. Um, I love Isaac. I just, you know, I, I love that they did show that, hey, your aromantic and um, asexual friends and stuff might be feeling this way. Especially when your friend group is consistent of a lot of different couples. Everyone's pairing off, basically. Yeah. Don't you know? forget about your other friends. <laughs> you know, it's so messed up that just in general, there's like, so there's a societal pressure to have, of having it be a man and a, and a woman in a relationship, right? And then on, so then you're in part of a queer friend group mm. and like, there's, you know, two men together, or whatever. And yet there's still that pressure of having to be in a pair. And then you have to come out to say, I don't want that. Right. It's like so messed up. It's like everybody is always just trying to dig into everyone's personal life. And it's almost unintentional. It's like mm. an involuntary thing, right? It's like we're all programmed to ask, who are you interested in? Who do you have a crush on? And so Isaac is there going, well, that's not for me. And yet still has to come out to people yeah i think um funny enough this kind of conversation was happening on a, a stream the other night and um it was just talking about like what you know we've made we've the society has made steps towards accepting of lgbtq people of different identities and everything but obviously we have a long way to go but what like when is there the thing the conversation of like when do you have to come out when you do not? You know, like when, when does that point happen? Because in this friend group of so many different types of relationships and identities, Isaac did have to come out, which is an interesting thought to think about. Cause it's like, oh, you would just think that like they would know, but you can't know something like this, unfortunately, but fortunately he was able to tell them. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of liked how he did it because it was a very Isaac way to do it it was i think it was in front of the jellyfish stuff when they were at their aquarium at the zoo and he's like maybe i don't like either and i don't want any <laughs> just get back to the book yeah and they're like <laughs> got it yeah we got it understandable <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's really an interesting thing of the pressure mm -hmm. and being forced and who is who is the friend that comes around when we initially thought that they would become a couple the friend that is that pops I think his around. name is James. I think it's James too. Yeah. I love that James, if that's their name, <laughs> is super okay with it, but also like still around. Hmm. You know, because I, I feel like he he did kind of get rejected last season, but like I think he's still trying, or at least trying to be there in some capacity, which I like because it, it can show what does a relationship or non-relationship look like. Um, right. and, and there can, there's still love there between friends, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the thing with Isaac. I have to admit, I always trip over Isaac's name 
because when the first season of Heartstopper came out, Toby, who is the actor that plays Isaac, did an amazing vlog series. Mm -hmm. And I just got to know him as Toby. And so now I'm like, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac. So I'm always (laughs) tripping over his name. I wish he did more of them, but I'm guessing just because Heartstopper became so popular, they're like no cameras on set for spoilers and stuff. (laughs) But anyway, um, I just love that there is love and support, right? And that's what this entire group is about and that no matter what your identity is or what you're going through we are here for you Mm -hmm. you know and and i think that isaac senses that from his friends and and that's really important even Mm -hmm. though they're all third wheeling him i tried to catch i'm sure because this is early um there's usually like eagle-eyed fans that will write down all of the books that Mm -hmm. isaac reads i know that they read genderqueer and one of my favorite books. This is how you lose a time war. If you have not read that wonderful, beautiful sci-fi novella, please read that book. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> um, but anyway, those were the two that I remember. Song of Achilles. I feel like Song of Achilles was in there as well. Okay, so we got three out yeah. of like maybe ten. <laughs> was he was he also reading one of the fake books by the Jonathan Bailey character? Oh, probably Jack Maddox at some point. I don't know. I think I think at one point he was also reading Heartstopper. So I don't know. We'll see. Da, 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 da. We'll, we'll, we'll keep a lookout for the list. Yeah. Okay, we have three more couples slash three more stories to talk about. Um go ahead, get get this next one. All right. So L and Tao, the two are mad for each other and explore the physical side to their relationship. Tao is still coping with L going to a school that is further away. And Elle works through her gender dysphoria and new online stardom. Oof. This was an interesting arc for the two of them. Mm. Um, mostly because I didn't expect it, which I should have, right? Um, I thought it was not only important to see a trans person in a relationship with somebody and what does that conversation of if they're still dealing with the dysmorphia what does that conversation look like? And then also, how does that person support that person? Yeah. You know, when they're having these conversations, Tao says something along the lines uh, to Elle uh, of, you know, I don't think of you as trans. And Elle is like, well, I am. And it's a big so, part of me. And so that's, that's who I am. And so, like, I appreciate that you're saying that, but you also have to know that's, that's me. Yeah, it, it almost feels like, I don't want to say it's to this extent, right? But it's like, you know, when people are like, you know, I don't see color or something like that. Again, it's not as bad as saying that, but it's it feels like that almost because it's like, no, I don't want you to ignore who I am mm-hmm. because I'm not ignoring it. So it would be weird if you ignored it. Yeah. Um, but I like that it opened up that conversation. Yeah. Um, also all of our, all of our little, our, our little babies here are like getting real physical. So it's like, what is this going to look like? Because that creates issues that creates closeness. Um, so I like that it did both of them, both of it for this couple here. It mm. showed, it brought them closer, but it also made them look at themselves. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I appreciated most though, is throughout the entire season, even though they're having these deeper conversations, they're still just psychotically in love with each other. They're perfect like, for each other. Tao cannot get enough of L in any sense of the word. He just wants to be with her and love her and support her nonstop. You know what I don't like? Tell me. That happened in this is that multiple people multiple times told Tao specifically or them together. It's like, oh, it's just the honeymoon phase. I can't stand it when people say that. That really bugs the shit out of me. And it's mostly because it's like, let them fucking enjoy it. Because like, yeah, maybe it will go away. Maybe it won't. But also like, why are you like being cynical about it? Like, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of times when people say that it's because Jealous. they're they're reflecting on their own relationship and they're not feeling that same spark anymore. So they have to let someone else know that like, it's going to go away. You yeah. know, look, <laughs> being in a relationship, uh, both of us, but also just being in being a human and being through relationships and stuff yes relationships change but like while the honeymoon phase is fantastic and beautiful and wonderful the stuff after it is just as good because you're more comfortable and you're so secure in that relationship 
You know what I mean? So well, it's like you evolve with that person. Yes. And I do think, though, that the stuff after the honeymoon phase is the stuff I think that truly shows you who the other person is. Because in the beginning, you're always trying to be like the top performing. Exactly. Of yourself. And, it maybe might be a lie or an exaggerated version of it. But well, yeah. I even think, though, that in the beginning, you're just both so infatuated with each other in in like just wanting to be around the person, wanting to touch them constantly, wanting to hear from them constantly. And so you're kind of blind to a lot of things and your own behaviors, their behaviors. And so once you get past that, although it's not the we're making out 24 seven thing anymore, there's a lot more to explore. And so you actually have to fit together yes. as a unit and, I, right. and you have to communicate and you have to talk to each other because in the beginning, it's like, hell yeah, we both want to be together all the time. Right. But, and don't forget about your friends. <laughs> well, there's also that <laughs> yeah. too. Um, so I just think that, yeah, there's that weird thing. People have said that to me. I remember when I was in my first, first relationship, um, the person my brother was dating at the time, she said to me, she's like, oh, you guys are still on the honeymoon stage, huh? And I didn't know what that meant. And it was like, she burst my little relationship bubble. Thanks. <laughs> so You know who you are. So full, like, stop saying it. Like, yeah. let's, let's, like, stop being mean to people. Unless, like, you're having a conversation with that person and they're like, yeah, I think the honeymoon phase is. It's like, okay, then have that conversation. Don't be like, the person is literally like, oh my God, I love them so much. We did blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's the honeymoon phase. You'll get over it. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> How dare you? Um, yeah. anyway, sorry, that was a side that really like bugged the shit out of me. Yeah, that, that is annoying, but I think it's something very real that yeah. happens. I also want to just touch on the fact that, and, and we see this when we get to Charlie and Nick as well, that there is no pressure from each of, from either of the partners in having to take the relationship to a physical level that one of them might not be comfortable with yet. So important. There's never that thing of like, oh, come on. I got a boner. Or you them like I mean? going and talking to the other friends being like, well, they won't do it. They yeah. won't do it. Ugh, it's so gross. Um, I like that a lot. And, I, you know, and I think it gave Tao some pause because it did seem like he was really more kind of feeling it out literally of like how far he can go. And when he did go a little too far for L, it kind of made him like step back a little bit. But then it, it he had to step up and be like, okay. We can talk about it or not talk about it, but he, he made it more seem like you want to talk about it. No, okay, let's let's just keep going. Like let's yeah. you know let's hang out or whatever. Um, and then to on onto the L side because I think Tao had a very big part in the season, but I think L had more of a part. Um, her getting recognition for her work, amazing. Her being used as a political pawn and the grander transgender political hellscape that is just on everybody's forefront of their mind um was not fun to see mm -mm. because i think i can't speak for transgender people but as a queer person constantly always in the news always something about lgbtq community why are rights being given to these certain types of people blah blah, blah. and it's just like why does the existence of me and i think l touched on it a little bit of like i i'm not just because I exist doesn't mean I'm political. And I think there was a moment with her with, during that interview when it started becoming very apparent of why that person wanted to interview Elle of like, maybe she didn't do any of the research. You know what? Like, you're just not born with all of the knowledge, all this political knowledge, just because you're queer. Well, I also think that just in the same way that we were saying, like, just because we're part of the community doesn't mean we're fully educated. I also think that just because you're part of the community doesn't mean that you have to be the mouthpiece for the community. Especially for people in your community. Right. And, and just the, in the sense of this is a 16-year-old girl who was blindsided with this interview, who just wanted to come on here and talk about their art and the fact that it was doing so well online and they're being used. You know, and so I also think that there has to be the respect given to folks of Listen, not all of us are, are comfortable with being in the spotlight and having to speak loudly about our rights. Um, I know for myself, I was bullied for a very long time. And so the thought of speaking out sometimes scares me, you know, and so I could understand that a feeling that pressure 
of you having to be the one to educate everyone, of you having to be the one to stick up for everyone, when sometimes you're just trying to survive as yourself and can't take on the emotional burden of having to represent every single other person in your community as well. And and being forced to do that. Because I feel like, you know, even just having a rainbow flag in your bio on any social media platform automatically puts a target on you. It's like, well, maybe I'm just trying to signal that I'm a safe space Mm -hmm. for people. Um, Yeah, it's really frustrating, but it was deeply upsetting seeing that. But also it was um, heartwarming to see how much support she had after that. Um, You know, Tao realizing like, oh, outside of our bubble isn't as safe as it seems. Her, her, the reaction of her parents was very encouraging to see because it's like, fuck yeah, like support your kid, but also like that sucks. Yeah. Like, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you protect your child? And I think like there's a thought of, oh, when she leaves, she's going to have to deal with this type of stuff. So like, did we best prepare her? You know, I'm just like, make, not, I'm like making things up for the parents, but like, that's how I would feel. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> like, it almost like in that sense, it's like, I didn't do my job as a parent right. to protect my child when, in the situation. Obviously they're not to blame. That's all of on course. that radio studio. Of course. Um, oh man. It was just like, it got dark and it was just like, ooh, frick, but she's strong. Yeah. She's an amazing group of friends with her. Um, I loved that it got resolved or at least she's finding herself again and Tao helped Mm -hmm. with that video, showing the video of her prior to her seeing herself differently or how the world might see her was just really, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I also think it speaks a little bit to Tao's journey just in general of seeing him become a documentary filmmaker, maybe, right? He, he's, he's only going to make. Oh, you're feeling sad? Let me make a video for yeah. you. I got yeah. it. <laughs> he knows that he can change the world of his friends with one video. I love um, it. But I love it too. And I think I thought that was a fun character development for Tao. We also got more of Tao's dancing, which I think is appreciated. He did. Like, yeah. Oh, I can't even do it. Yeah. Like, that move a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just classic Tao. A lot of hips. Yeah. And I just think that, Again, it's about that communication. It's about opening up to each other. It's about trusting in your partner and as mature, well. Yeah, and maturing in your relationship because I, I very much feel like he he was overcompensating a lot because they weren't going to be around each other all the time. And I think as most of the parties in this show and us as people find out that like it's not the end of the world when you can't be around that person. If you're afforded the opportunity to be around them, fantastic. If not, it's not the end of the world. You're fine. And it's also the funny thing of like, Elle was going to a different school anyway. It just wasn't the school next door anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, she's still in the same town. Like, Yeah, you're going to, you still see her on weekends and at night and stuff. Chill out. He, he was just really smitten. Yeah. He's just so head over heels in love with her. He can't help himself. Okay. So again, we're, we're down to our final two and we have a surprise new relationship. Mm. Um, Okay, introduce the second to last. All right, so this is Tori and Michael. So Tori's worry about her brother's illness takes over from takes over most of her life. However, once she sees he's doing better, a surprise in the form of Michael enters her life. Oh, okay. So Tori continues to be the greatest older sister that has ever existed in history. <laughs> I most most of the time in the season when I cried or got really teary was because of her and just seeing how much she has not let herself be herself because she worries so much for her brother and she's an amazing older sister and she was finally able to be like, he's fine. And then something amazing came in the form of Michael, who yeah. seems we haven't seen much of him, is quirky. Likes her a lot. I like seeing her like this where she can be like, okay, this is my boy. I'm going to go upstairs and you guys have fun. Yeah. Like she needs that. She does. And I liked also, you know, we all knew that Tori was awesome. And so we get to see how much she truly loves Charlie in this season. But I also liked getting to see her, you know, during the one episode where they're celebrating Charlie's birthday with the tent party of just kind of being the cooler older sister Right. They're like they go around being like, OK, mom and dad are going to come on 30 minutes. You got to clean this up. 
mm-hmm. you know? So she got to kind of be a little more relaxed in her role as the older sister. And not a parent. Right. Mm-hmm. Or someone who needed to protect him from the big bad. Right. You know, she was there to just be like, come on guys, we got to get this together. I loved how much we got to see of her this season because I think it was really important to show, you know, because Charlie's dad is supportive, but again, he is somebody that's supportive when the mother deems it okay Mm. or appropriate. Like he's very much, the dad doesn't want to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. And so he's more supportive when the mom isn't around, vice versa. Um, so it was really good to see that this support was always going to be there for Charlie. Um, I'm excited to see more and to see what that relationship looks like. Um, but also going into our last couple of Nick and Charlie, I loved that we got to get more of her, particularly in these two in episode four and five. I, those two episodes were amazing, astounding, so well done. Um, and it's in part of these kind of three people, mm-hmm. Nick, Charlie, and Tori. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love them. I love Tori yeah. so much. I also liked towards the end of the season, you know, where her and Michael sort of have this falling out because he wants to very much define their relationship as boyfriend and girlfriend. And she's like, I don't really need the label. I just want us to be together. But I liked the little bit of a switch where Charlie got to kind of be the sibling that was solving her problem or helping her with her issue rather than her always having to be the one that helps him. Because I don't think that's happened yet. No. He's always come to her or she's always asked him. And so for them to be able to be on that Ferris wheel and, oh God, I love that moment so much. Coming from somebody that has like siblings, you have siblings too. (laughs) You don't have siblings. I just have one. Yeah. But like, you know, those moments, like it just like, you know, those moments and how special and sometimes not frequent they are. Yeah. If you're lucky enough, you have a sibling that you can talk to like that. Right. Um, So beautiful. Tens across the board. Loved it. Yes. And I just want to say, I just love getting to see Tori go from the floating aura in the background to literally being a part of the story. Yeah. Oh, crying so much. (laughs) She's so good. (laughs) She's so amazing. Jenny Walzer is just, I wish that she was involved in more of the press for the show, to be completely honest with you. I don't see her in as many of the YouTube videos and stuff. Hopefully next season she is. Because you know how sometimes they don't want to like tell people like what characters are going to be like higher so hopefully also hey you want to be on the podcast come on we Mm -hmm. love you (laughs) please all right should we move on our final couple all right so nick and charlie profess their love for each other but things become even more serious when nick voices his concern for charlie's eating habits the pair explores wanting to take their relationship to a physical level and choices about uni loom Ooh, okay. This was really, this was actually really fun doing it couple by couple. Um, cause we usually don't go this in depth, but I, since we're doing one episode for the whole season, it's needed. These two boys, <laughs> these two boys always being silly, always just like, just talk to each other sometimes, you know, um, I, okay. I'm trying to like form my thoughts here. I loved that we got past that doughy phase Mm -hmm. between both of them because granted they hadn't said i love you yet we knew from the cliffhanger from the last season it was coming um they did i know that this is the scene from the the book they said i love you just how they did in the book with nick outside or charlie outside the door and nick in the shower um i thought it was very rom-com very like of course they did and he's walking away and he's running after him uh, but you need those moments, right? You need the the fun moments before it gets heavy. <laughs> yeah, there's always there's a lot of um, people in the rain moments in Heartstopper, <laughs> or or running after each other in the rain or on the street or something like that. We got another one of those here, and so you know, it's I think it was interesting for Nick in this season to be so in love with someone, but also realizing that they're not perfect in every way. Um, or no, I don't think that's the right phrasing Hmm. that um getting to see that that love you have goes beyond holding hands and having little sparks shoot out there's actually a lot that comes along with truly loving someone and i think also finding your identity with that person Hmm. and not necessarily like sexual or whatever but like okay you love this person you're saying you love this person you want to be that person's partner whatever form that takes 
they are going through this thing or they have this thing that they need to deal with, where, how are you going to deal with that? And I loved, I loved, 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 who's the aunt's name? Aunt Diane, mm. I believe. Um, standout character for me. She was only in really one scene fully. Captain Britain. Captain Britain. <laughs> Peggy Carter. Peggy Carter. <laughs> Is it hard um, stopper? Yes. Um, I think it was so important. We'll get into the 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 Charlie stuff, but I think Nick learning how you support somebody without literally being a people pleaser is really important for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And in a relationship with somebody that is going through a an eating disorder, that isn't something that you can readily see. Um, I think it, I learned some things of like, oh, that would be a good way to support somebody and not always bringing up the problem. Right. (laughs) I, so in the novella that Alice Oseman wrote this winter, um, that novella is, is all of episode five basically. And in the novella, something is said along the lines of where Charlie is just looking for someone who's willing to find the middle ground in their support in the sense of don't completely ignore that I'm going through something. And don't come out and be like, you eating anything? What are you doing? It's just be here for me. Yeah. Mama spring. Yeah. Oof. Awful. Um, and, and she's a complicated character. She is. It's one of those things where it's like she's doing the wrong thing and she becomes the pseudo villain of the season. But also you can't help but feel for her because she's not getting the support that Nick is getting mm. from somebody of like, this is how you should support somebody mm-hmm. going through this. She's just, yeah. Why aren't you eating? We have to be perfect. And and I think that's just the type of person she is prior to right. even realizing that he's sick of, you know, concentrate on this. You can't see Nick that often. And so she just makes things worse. I think she also like actively just doesn't want to acknowledge it. Mm. Like coming from a household where, I mean, still to this day, <laughs> Of, I love you, but I don't accept whatever. It gave me very much that vibes Mm. where it's like, yeah, I love you because you're like my kid, but like, I don't accept who you are or what's going on with you. So I'm just going to pretend that everything is fine. You know what I mean? That like awful thing that religious people, well, not just religious people, but it's like love, hate the sin, not the love, the sinner, hate the sin or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that mentality. That that's the the feeling I got from her. Maybe not like that super intense because towards the end it does seem like she came around a little bit or at least is more willing to not judge him completely, which is fantastic. We love that for um old Charlie Spring. Growth. Yeah, growth. Um but I think they handled not handled, but portrayed what he was going through really, really well. Episode four, that's really when he's like getting the treatment and everything. And I love that you get it from both perspectives Mm -hmm. because I think that is so important. There was a moment where it's Nick's perspective, I believe, first, and he's writing it. It's like going through the months and everything. And he's like, this really helped him. He's doing amazing and blah, blah, blah. But then you get to Charlie's point of view and he's not at the point that Nick is saying he's at. And I think that is really important and kind Mm -hmm. of like, oh, yeah, like you could assume that or they could be saying that. But it's not the case. Yeah. And I also think they did a really great job of illustrating the the ups and downs that come with sort of any type of recovery, you know. And I think that illustrating the fact that even in the beginning, right, finally Nick and Charlie having the conversation and then finally Charlie telling his parents, they took him to like a general practitioner, but then to go to a specialist, it was like months away, you know, and, and also a lot of money and a lot of money. And then there was an emergency, you know, and so they had to put him into a, a treatment, a place to get treatment. Um, but even once he, he leaves the treatment center, he has relapses because, you know, it's, it's an eating disorder compounded with self-harm. And so, and OCD and OCD. And so there's just so much that goes into it. It's not like a, you you go to the place, you come back, you're perfect. Which you know? is so important that they showed that. And I, and I think with any, with anything, there's that outside perspective of, you know, especially in this case, just eat something. What's wrong? Just eat something. But it, it's not, you know what I mean? There's just so much that Charlie is dealing with. And so 
it's you're not only you're trying he's he trying to balance his own healing but he's also trying to balance the the thoughts of others around him and also like trying to progress his relationship with somebody that he is head over and heals love with so it was it was a very like it was a heavy season in that there was so much emotion and growth and like um hurt and love that went into the season um that I really wasn't expecting I didn't expect it to get as serious as it did um but I like that it did because it's not all again sparks and great needle drops and everything which again though the show does real well Mm -hmm. it gets that music done down so well it gets those little and oh the little animations anyway yeah they were (laughs) just like i mean what are we gonna say i think the thing is though is that this season brings all of the pastel charm of the first two seasons but then grounds it in in very real storylines of what these folks are going through and i think that if you've also grown with the season that is a change that I don't want to say it was needed, but I think is something that um, was welcomed yeah. by the viewers. And I think that there was still that joy and that love and that great queer community and chosen family. But I think within that, these are still people who are dealing with things, some outside of, like, of their identities and others within their identities. And I think that all of life's journey is this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that man, when you're 16 and coming out of the closet, that shit is scary. And then you're dealing with school pressure and friend pressure and everything else on top of it. So life is freaking complicated. Also, Nick is a little older mm-hmm. and he's on his way out of high school. So it's like, what does that look like? Um, anything else with Nick and Charlie? I feel like we we waited so long to get to them and it was just like, ooh. I mean, I, oh, the physical side. I feel like this has been building and building and building, right? It's like, okay, they're together when they're like, which is weird, right? It's like they're kids, like, but also they're kids. We've all been there. Um, I really appreciated that when they do finally like get intimate with each other, or at least completely like pants are gone, right? That I think Charlie asks Nick, he's like, does it count as sex? If it was just touching or something like that. And I like that Nick was like, yeah, it does. It does. It 100% does. Especially, I feel like as queer couples, you got so many things that you can do. Like, you know, like <laughs> anything can be considered <laughs> you know, I, intimate. Yeah, I. it's funny because I was, I, I think what Heart Supper also makes me do, I don't know if it does this for you, but it makes me reflect on my early relationships, especially my first one. And I was like, you know, because... The realization that over three seasons is like we've just gone to over a year of them being together, right? So although it's been years for us in making this production in their relationship, it's only been a year. So I was thinking like, oh gosh, how long was I in my first relationship before I lost my virginity? Mm. You know, it was definitely a lot less. You lost than a your year. virginity in every new relationship. Well, just in, <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> You don't have to be in a relationship to lose your virginity. No, I, it just so happened that mine were the same. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing you because the way you said it was like each time I was in a relationship, I lost my virginity. <laughs> well, you know, I am an angel. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really liked that they had that open conversation with it, and then like they talked about it, and they were going further from that. And there's also nothing like having. Your your girlfriends around you, and then making you buy condoms and lube. Mm. I mean, listen, that was a very grown up journey that he went on with Tara and Imogen. Right? Is they went to go explore different universities. Elle was there too. Oh, that's right. Elle was there too. And on that journey, condoms and lube. Oh yeah. Which I think you know, to be completely honest, as a teenager, I was not embracing lube, which I think that's a very important lesson. Because again, they need kids need proper sex education. Yes, and I loved that in this show they called it out because they weren't they didn't learn anything. Yes, it is important to know how condoms work. Of course, go further than that. Talk to them about condoms. Do not prevent everything. You should use lube even when using a condom. (laughs) Like yes, just like I was like. Yeah, as teenagers, you should know that lube is a thing. Like, there's something about, I feel like, especially with straight people, I feel like this is a thing where 
when lube is brought up or like in the conversation of sex, it makes it dirtier Mm. or less likely to be talked about because like, that's like, that means like you're actually going to have sex. I don't know. It's like so bizarre. I feel like any conversation or I've heard conversations or where it's like, oh, they did it or whatever. And it's like something with lube comes up and then it's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, this has got weird. It's like, "Mm, lube made it weird. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know much about straight sex. So (laughs) I just, mm, I do. (laughs) People are weird. (laughs) I don't know. Like, and especially like in a school setting, I feel like it's like once you start bringing things that just aren't the penis, the vagina and a condom, then it's like too much. True. I mean, I, I enjoy like, if you, go to like a local LGBT center, like not only sometimes will they have the bowl of condoms, but they'll also have a bowl of little lube packets, Mm -hmm. which is like beautiful. Also like how to douche. Yes. People need to learn that. Do not flood yourself for the love of God. Dear Lord, (laughs) be careful. We'll just make a sex education not done by sex experts. Exactly. So (laughs) that's the new spinoff. I don't know if that's going to be helpful (laughs) at all. It's just going to be me going. So wait, what is what happens in straight sex? And and then being like lube's important. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. We're wrapping this up, right? Oh, sorry. We're we're wrapping it up on lube. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Well, not yet. There are some things that I feel like me as a Heart Supper fan and fan of this podcast, I'm going to assume that people would be upset if we don't mention um halloween halloween costumes we have to talk about the halloween costumes for a second kit connor america come on captain america great they're like fantastic you know i i watched i saw some scenes from season one he looks so different oh yeah now they're growing up yes and of course he's working out like a madman because he's like a star (laughs) so like him in that captain america suit you're like Good for you, Kit Connor. Right. Yeah. And I also love that he did it because he knows that Charlie doesn't like Marvel. Right. Mm-hmm. Is that the thing? Yeah. Like, that's the joke is like, he's not into Marvel and he's like, well, I'm going to wear this now because you're not here. And we <laughs> all know our little Joe Locke is starring in a Marvel series right now. Mm-hmm. But um, Cha. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're really hitting us with the jokes. This um, season. Oh, I just, I love the Halloween episode. I love it when shows like this, when we love the cast so much, does like holiday stuff Mm -hmm. i don't know it's just like it's fun yeah and like those four and five were very heavy on holidays and so that was fun to see them celebrating in that way it makes us feel closer to them it's like i celebrate those holidays too (laughs) i know that (laughs) um two more things oliver is here and got a mention i do know from what derek has said and i've seen online oliver is technically supposed to be charlie's younger brother yes but he's their cousin I guess in the show, which is, I feel like interesting, but makes sense to me. <laughs> so just think of poor Tori in the book universe of Heartstopper, where she is constantly worried about two younger brothers. Yikes. It's too much. Good it's thing much. she only has to worry about Mario Kart. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With one of them. And then one of the last things that I will mention is Henry. Oh, the Pugalicious baby. Yeah. Nick got a new little baby, sweet little angel named henry and that pug was wiling out this entire time <laughs> it was so cute noah brought my attention to the fact that especially there was a scene where they're all on the couch and it's both henry and uh nelly the other dog and they're just both staring in the same direction so you know there was just some handler off the side getting their attention it was so cute though you'll get your bacon if you just mm-hmm. little... oh okay so mvp for the season who's your mvp oh my gosh oh i i mean nick Nick is my MVP for the season. I feel like he's your MVP every season. Well, yeah. He's just the golden well, retriever of a human. That's the thing, is that he is, so far, you know, through most of the series, he's what you want in a partner. He's supportive. He's willing to listen to you. He's going to talk. He's not going to pressure you into anything. He's like, <laughs> wow. who, who I want to be wow. in a relationship. He's like, he's what you want in a relationship, not... I Me. didn't say I am that. <laughs> I don't think either of us are that. Sorry. <laughs> You're not supportive. You're not. <laughs> I know. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Who's your MVP? I'm fine. Oh, man. As soon as I said it, I'm like, oh, no, I have to say one too. Tori. Mm. I loved it. I think acting performance so good. 
um, which is like fun for that type of character because for two seasons really now, she's just been like sipping a drink and like saying one-liners. Yeah. But ever since the um, dinner with Nick's family and that stupid fucking older brother Mm -hmm. that I still can't stand and she told him off ever since then I was like I liked you before I love you now you know the interesting thing about our two picks and this is something I've been kind of reflecting on with this season is you know Charlie is the one that is dealing with an eating disorder he's he's going through that journey but what this season showed us and not in a selfish way is that when people truly love you and care about you and you're going through something very difficult, it affects them Mm -hmm. as well. And I think they were two of the characters, at least of our main characters, beside his parents, that really had to deal with Charlie going to this facility and, and, and going through what he went through. So I just think it's interesting that we both liked those characters who were really going through the most. Hmm. Yeah. And I I think, yeah, because it did, they got a lot of screen time too, you know? <laughs> um, also, last thing. I know I already said one last thing. Last thing. What do you think is going to happen? We got the little, the girls trip, I will say, to all the unis. It did seem like everybody, even though they all love Charlie, they were all like, hey, Nick, you're amazing, but like, Charlie can't be your whole world. What are you going to do? Are you going to leave? Are you going to pick a university that's like Leeds, Kent? Like, (laughs) which one are you going to pick? And what does that mean for Charlie? What does it mean for our heart heart stopper couple? What do you think? Do you know? Oh, no. (gasps) No. Okay. So what do you think? I know. I think he's going to go to a college and then it's going to be that type of thing. I'm not looking at your face because... You're not telling me, but I hope you're not. Um, I think he's going to go to a college and then it's going to be, again, that other part of a relationship of how do you do it long distance? How's that work? That's going to be really upsetting. Oh, my God. That's scary. I remember Mm. going through that. It was very scary to think about. Even Mm. with friends. Friends leaving. Yeah. Hard. Oh, my God. Well, let us know who Mm. your MVP was. What do you think Nick is going to do? If you know, do not tell me. (laughs) Because I read comments. <laughs> Do not spoil this for me. Um, We're only allowed to have spoilers. You can't give us spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also just let us know what you thought of Heartstopper Season 3. I This show, every season gets better and better. I thought I loved it before. This is just too good. Yeah, the storyline just keeps getting better and better. The characters get better and better. The actors get better and better. So it's just chef's kiss. Can't wait to see it. The next installment. Oh, and they're getting them out quicker. Very happy. I know, that. but that's the hard thing though, is that we binge and then you gotta wait. I'll binge watch it wait, again. I feel wait. like we just need to watch all three again. Yeah. Get the full experience. Oh my god. Fall rewatch. So sweet. Oh, okay. Well, bye, lovely little messy babies. Yes. <laughs> all just just look around and know that people love you and support you and you got this. Yeah. All right, till next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.